Welcome to the Agile Wire, where professional scrum trainers Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky discuss agile topics. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky. And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right. So this week we've got uh, Steve Pereira and Bradley Clerken on the uh, podcast with us. Uh, so uh, Bradley's been on the show before. We've we've had conversations around DevOps. That's what we want to focus on today. Steve, can you just give a little background uh, to our listeners, like who you are and you know what makes you uh, I don't know relevant in the in this conversation <laughs> we're going to have about flow and DevOps and all kinds of things. Good, good phrasing. What what exactly is that <laughs> makes you relevant? Here? I love that. What a challenge, right? Yeah. Why are you here? Uh, why should we not hang up on you? Um, so I've been in tech for uh, over 20 years. Um, I, I started in tech support. I've been through software development, build and release engineering, uh, consulting, and a CTO role before starting my own company. And my company is focused on basically the culmination of all that experience. So looking throughout my career and realizing that, first of all, people working together is the most important thing that's missing from tech. And tools and models that help people work together is the other thing that's missing from tech. And so Visible is really about collaborative mapping practices that bring people together and get ideas, pains, challenges, goals out of their heads and onto a surface that everybody can see and work on so that they can understand what is working, what's not working, where should we focus? And that I think is uh, relevant to agile software engineering practices, DevOps, business, um, marketing, sales, success, anywhere that we want to look, those practices are going to get more and more critical. Um, and I think they've been underrated and underserved for a very long time. Cool. So making the hidden invisible is a really powerful thing. Uh, that's what I heard there. Uh, for, is what your tool is trying to do. So, what's um, what normally happens when you make the hidden visible and these value stream maps that you're that you're going through? Like, what's a what does it normally look like when you're helping an organization and they see some things for the first time? It can be a variety of things. Um, it's a it's a great question because it really matters um, what outcomes the organization is aiming for. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've started to look beyond value streams upstream to what is the actual outcome that we want to achieve? Like, where are you headed? Um, and what I find is across organizations and even within teams, if you ask different people, you get different answers. Uh, like, what are we doing? Why are we doing the thing that we're doing? Uh, because we don't step away from the work to actually examine you know, where are we headed? And do we all have the same understanding of where we're headed? Which means that people have challenges with different incentives, challenges working together, challenges making decisions on their own and feeling confident that they're doing the right thing. So the mapping really gives a team an, an, an opportunity to kind of step away from their work, come together and either establish clarity or reestablish clarity, right? They might feel like they know that they have they have everything figured out, but usually what happens is they come together and map and we, feel, we realize that there's a lot of gaps between what people think and what's actually happening. And um, that's really valuable because you want, you, you want to give teams autonomy, right? We want teams to be able to operate on their own and make good decisions. So it means that they have to have a lot of clarity in order to do that, or else you have to constantly be correcting them, right? And stepping in and saying, no, 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 not this, like move this way or do, do it more this way. And with clarity of outcome, you can sort of step away and say, they're, they're heading in the right direction. I know that they're all on the same page. We can focus elsewhere. And I think that's really powerful. Quick break. We know you can't support all shows, but when you do support a show, think of the Agile Wire when you subscribe and share. What is that? So I'm trying to like envision that even in my, you know, my, my current situation. And when you've got concurrent work streams that are going, going on or product lines that are going on, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 teams worth, like 
you know, how do you step back and holistically look at that from an organization, a portfolio program, however you want to think about that? Like, how do you start that conversation? And then how does it cascade into all of those concurrent work streams that are going on? That's this is a great frame for for the conversation, um, like bringing it into reality. And I think that what I always advise folks to start from is the customer and work backwards from the customer, right? So mm-hmm. what is the customer outcome that we're driving towards? And in the absence of that, like let's say we're removed from the customer to the point where it's it's not entirely relevant. Uh, although, I mean, that's kind of a smell of something, something being wrong. But if you're not directly to connected to the customer, there is still a customer, right? There's a, there's a business customer or there's, there might be an individual contributor customer. Um, so starting from the customer and the customer outcome, you can translate that into an internal outcome. Like what is it that we want that's going to get the customer what they want? And then you can look at what is the stream that is contributing to that outcome, right? What is feeding that outcome and making it happen? And that gives you an idea about the boundaries that you're that you're looking at. And usually what happens when you have multiple concurrent streams is that you've got a variety of these streams coming together to contribute to that outcome, which means you have a high level value stream. And then you can zoom in and look at the contributing value streams as well. So let's say you have a product portfolio, which gets released maybe every month. But inside of that product portfolio, you have other products and you have products that depend on other products. And then some of those products depend on an internal platform and other ones depend on an external platform. And you can have partners contributing to that. You can visualize all these streams independently, but you can show how they kind of roll up to this high level. And what that means is that you can start high and dig down where you see constraints. So what's the most painful part about this high level value stream that's contributing to the customer outcome? And why aren't we able to deliver this thing effectively, right? Why is this quality breaking down or why does it take so long to do this? Then you can zoom into the value streams that are contributing to that constraint or where that constraint is happening and really kind of zoom out and zoom in until you have this really clear understanding of like, this is happening because this is happening because this is happening and this is happening. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you stop that eventually because it means, you know, you could, you could go on forever, but that practice of being able to dig down and see how all those contributions are factoring into your high level customer outcome makes all the contributions by individuals, super relevant, right? All of a sudden, all the individuals know, when I do this, here's what happens. And that level of visibility and understanding of the system as a whole is something that's really rare. And I've never seen it happen without mapping. Like we can't do these things just in our heads and we certainly can't do them in our heads independently and then count on the fact that they're gonna be the same between two people, right? So getting it out and onto a surface really helps. So I got a question. So if you're mapping this out, does that usually lead to a lot of change into the way the stream is constructed? Or do do you then use the map to maybe manage within the constraints and the way things are currently set up in the system? Yeah, it could be both. I mean, in, in cases where you have a lot of control and autonomy over how the work gets done, you can change a lot. Um, especially when you have the focus of like, okay, we know the problem isn't in the, this 90% of the value stream, we know it's in this 10%, all of a sudden you can laser focus, which means you can get a lot done. Uh, yeah. Instead of people chasing like, yeah, I think the problem's here and here and here, and we're all working like completely disconnected from each other. When the whole team knows where the constraint is, all of a sudden it's like putting the sun through a magnifying glass, right? You can just blast that thing and and really fix it. Um, so in some cases you can do that other cases where you can't, you can manage things at the edges, right? So let's say we can't change any individual activity because we don't necessarily have control over it. We can change the interaction models, right? So we can change how we get work from other parties. Maybe we can make it easier for them to hand work to us. Maybe we can make it easy to hand work to the next 
part of the value stream. And so even if you can't change any individual step, you can change sort of the, the flow around it. So when you talk about value streams, a lot of times when I'm coming in to talk to clients, it's about product definition. And so the product definition, I usually I start at the same spot. Who is your actual customer? What's somebody buying? Who is actually using it? Who are the people that are actually building it? And what are constraints within that, like code bases, dependencies, things like that, right? Um, so what I see in a lot of organizations is that they are structured for economies of scale, not economies of flow. Mm -hmm. And if they would structure an economy as a flow, so they would actually align around what a real product is delivers to a market, like how they solve some problem in the world, um, that they would they would organize differently and they'd work differently. And maybe this value stream map actually helps them see that. Um, do you do you see that like that happening? Like, oh, maybe we, our product isn't system A and system B and system C. It's actually how users interact between all three of these systems that we that we call products and are, you know, internally, but they're really something much bigger. That's a really smart way of kind of stepping away and looking at what we're really doing here, right? When we're building things. And I think that there are, there's modes that organizations can be in and you can get stuck in those modes, right? So you've got like, if you want to think of two big buckets, you have like explore and exploit, right? And if... Yep an organization is stuck in exploit, they have all these assumptions about value that they baked a long time ago. And now they're trying to like expand the margin on those things and say like, we're gonna maximize value. We're going to maximize throughput um, in order to capitalize on this. But it may be worthwhile, like if you see basically a decline or a missed opportunity, then you could switch modes and say, okay, let's let's lean further into explore to validate some of these assumptions that we've been operating under for a very long time, which means what we want to do is create a flow of learning rather than a flow of delivery. And you can inject activities into the value stream that help you learn. Um, and it might actually mean going faster so that you learn faster, right? So it's not necessarily means that you slow down. It might actually mean that you speed up, but you focus on processing the learning outcomes of the value stream and injecting that learning back into the value stream. But the value stream gives you this like nice model to really understand where you want to put those inflection points or, or specific activities that will capture learning or create opportunities for learning or feedback to be more general. So you're talking so about, you were, oh, oh, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> I was um, going to say, you were talking about outcomes before, and I was thinking about like, well, how do we know this? Like how do we know we're making a difference from what you're saying here with these different inflection points and a whole value stream. And I don't know, I've been saying this for a long time and I would like to get your opinion on it. Like, I think if you want to have one measure for measuring that, it's the number of experiments that you're running or have run um, over a given period of time. Like we should be tracking that. So people might call that innovation rates. People might call it something else, but it's really like we have an idea. How fast can we get that idea into an experiment to validate our greatest assumption that we have with that? If we can run many of those, if we can do many of those things and we can do them pretty quickly, then we have a great opportunity for learning and figuring out stuff because I don't know if I've learned anything in product management as we've done stuff and built products. It's like you're wrong and you need to figure out how wrong you are as fast as possible. Um, and so that's that's probably the greatest measure is just run a bunch of experiments and figure out where to, where to go next. You know, I don't know. What are your thoughts? I, I totally agree with that. I think that uh, experiments are super underrated because they're hard and it's much easier to operate under an assumption that we know what is valuable, right? That means that we can focus on exploit. It means that we can put our heads down and get to work. And we can work more in isolation, which is more comfortable to us most of the time, especially as technical folks, right? We like to kind of dis decide on a direction and then go away and like noodle on stuff and play with stuff until we have something that we think is valuable and then share it with the world, right? But in reality... And increasingly with knowledge work, you know, the most valuable work is put something in front of customers, get feedback on it, and then adapt, right? And like basically assume you're wrong all the time, 
which is very uncomfortable, right? Like no yes. one wants to operate in that mode, but that is the best operating model, right? Uh, so I think that um, what really makes the experiments work is that they're attached to an outcome, right? Otherwise, you could be experimenting with all kinds of random stuff that's never going to pay off. And you're not necessarily going to be building an understanding over time. You can learn a lot of stuff, but if it's not contributing to an increased understanding, then you, you might be wasting your time. So tying it to an outcome means that you're more able to translate your learning into understanding, which can build uh, an opportunity for you to identify value and, and build this keener sense of a connection between expected value and realized value or delivered value, right? Mm -hmm. Makes me think One of, of this. Oh, oh, Jeff, sorry. I'm going to let you go, Jeff. <laughs> it's all right, dude. Go ahead. Uh, I just, you made me think of this uh, James Whitaker. Um, he, this guy, you wish to work with Microsoft, Google, and different places. And I heard him speak a number of years ago, and this quote sticks with me. I keep thinking about this. I think about it often. And he said, um, um, he just kind of gave this information or this example about data and information. So data is just the raw stuff that comes in. Information is something we can use and we can learn from. And information is the new oil. Like that's the thing we should care about in all organization. Like how much information can we get to make better decisions, to take advantage of something, you know, to provide more value in, in a marketplace, whatever it is. And so you made me think there, like the more we have that information and with boundaries, so you're not just out random running a bunch of experiments. It's like within these boundaries, we need to learn these things so that we can go in direction A or B, but if the possibilities are endless, you hardly even know where to go. Like you don't even know what, you know, if you, you don't, even, if you don't know the destination, you're just going to do a lot of rambling and wandering throughout the woods, you know, but if you know where you want to go and you know, a, a course, you can figure out that course to go if you have a destination that you're trying to get to. So I like that. Uh, Jeff, where were, where were you going to go with the conversation? Um, I was just going to ask a little bit more, uh, well, well, comment and then a question. So, I have a tendency to, when I'm thinking about flow, it's it's focused on the, the delivery team, the product team. Um, but what I liked about what you were talking about earlier with all those concurrent workflows that were going on and dependencies and all that was it was really more holistic. Like let's concept to cash really sort of think about these things that are moving through our system. Let's start with our customer. Let's start with the outcome that we're going after. Uh, and then from that, I was kind of curious is it literally a step or working backwards from that point? Like let's retrace it starting at Z and going backwards all the way through to A where it is inside of there, list out or visualize all the dependencies, all the handoffs, all the steps that go on and then start to holistically have a conversation about all of that. Okay, so you're, you're, you're nodding. And where I feel like I fall into the trap is very often the upstream and the, well, I, I'm, I'm downstream, right? Like by the time it gets to us and it's released, it's out to a customer. But, you know, typically there's a whole bunch of stages that were upstream from us that we haven't really quite considered. Like, all right, did this go to the legal and compliance team? All right, did this go to the editors to make sure that the right copy is going to appear on the website? Did this, you know, all of those different steps before it even hits to the delivery team. So um, what... <sighs> I, I guess I'm uh, the the question that I'm trying to form in my head is like what typically comes out of that conversation when we broaden the visibility of thinking about flow from just the delivery team to more holistically to the organization. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's going to be different in every organization because everyone has a different culture that kind of synthesizes this information into insights and, and behaviors ultimately, right? I mean, it, it's going to affect organizations differently depending on their culture and their cultural antibodies, right? You introduce these concepts to organizations and there's gonna be a natural pushback of like, why do we need to do this? Um, because our current system is is operating, you know, to, to whatever degree it's operating, right? If, whether people think it's operating well or, or, or not. But I think what's, what's really the major learning here about looking at the whole system and starting from outcomes, these are very connected things. Like outcomes are delivered by systems, right? Um, they're not delivered by effort, right? We arrive at outcomes based on a system that we create that 
delivers that outcome by consistently operating through patterns, right? Uh, that it's been engineered to create. And that's kind of a big idea, but um, increasingly, like uh, more common in the industry, we're starting to actually like step away from individual contributions and think in terms of teams and think in terms of organizations and models and capabilities and systems because what we're starting to realize is that individual contributors really have like such a small influence on anything. And that manifests itself in so many different ways that like work against organizations, right? Thinking about individuals, like assigning blame to any person for like a system failure, is just a total waste of time. It just destroys morale and culture of your organization, right? Thinking in terms of the system and being like, there's no other way that this could have happened, right? When something goes wrong, the system was engineered to deliver that outcome, right? And so mm -hmm. you're really served by stepping away and thinking of, okay, how do we build a better system that delivers the outcomes that we want? And when we think about outcomes, a lot of people might struggle with thinking about like, what is the difference between an objective and an outcome and why I think in terms of outcomes? And there are technical uh, frames for this and there are non-technical frames like non-technical would be like manifesting the future right um, which I think is actually very valuable like having a vision for the future means that you're going to notice a bunch of signals and engine engineer a bunch of things that are going to move you in a specific direction and um, in terms of technical uh, manifestations we can design constraints, enabling constraints that mean that we can eventually bounce our way to the outcome that we want. And a helpful framing that I like to share with people is the idea of a press release, right? Like what is, what is, what are people going to write about? What would you write about the outcome as if it's already happened? And then you can sort of think about it as this concrete thing and then work backwards from that. Like what would it take to get there? Also, what are the things that are in the way of that happening and why hasn't it happened already? Because there's something in the system that's actually preventing you from being there or else you'd be there already. Mm -hmm. What's uh, up, Bradley? You got a question? I, I hope this comes through. Can you yeah, hear we me? Can hear you. Oh, this is great <laughs> technology. Um, Steve, one of the things that was kind of popping through my head and something that I spend a lot of time talking to folks about is and what I kind of came to the realization was uh, a number of years ago, thinking about value stream maps, and I wanted to get you, how, how you talk to folks about this, but um, I focus nowadays a lot on it being a skill, right? Uh, that, you know, we really need to teach people how to do versus I think so, for so long, the Six Sigma folks would kind of come in and do it as like a once a year, once every 10 year process. Um, so I guess what's your take on, you know, it being a skill set that we really need to get into everyone's hands. And then like, kind of, how do you approach that uh, if, if that is the case? I totally agree with that. I think that this needs to be uh, beyond a skill. Like I liked thinking in terms of capabilities because capabilities are kind of made up of a number of different skills, right? And when we think of value stream mapping, the technical skill of mapping is, is I find it's actually less valuable than this skill of facilitation, right? The, the ability, and that's the thing that I've learned the most over the past two years is that I know nothing about getting people to open up and feel comfortable and safe and like share their ideas and then steer a conversation in a very productive way to instill an understanding of like what value streams are and why they're relevant to people and then take those individual perspectives and merge them together. There's a lot of things that happen beyond the, the technical construction of a value stream map that are, I think, even more valuable. So yes, we can have a technical skill about how do you create the map. You can have a technical skill about how do you measure accurately or accurately enough, because that's also a big challenge. But I think that these like human aspects of facilitation and bringing people together and getting the right information out of people's heads uh, and then representing that in a, in a useful way, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be super accurate as long as it's useful. 
uh, that is that is very valuable, and that is a missing capability uh, within organizations. There is also another piece where you can't analyze a system from inside the system as effectively as you can from outside the system some of the time, or maybe even most of the time. I might go that far, right? As in like, you can't see the water that you're swimming in. If you are in the trenches working uh, in the daily work, you're kind of fixated on what is right in front of you, right? You're worried about the thing that needs to be delivered next week. You can't necessarily afford to step away and think of like, where is this going? Right. And, and, and how are we doing from an objective, a more objective perspective? So even in situations where I think it's super valuable to have this internal capability because it develops an understanding and an appreciation, but there's still a ton of value in having someone come in from outside, especially because of cross pollination, like they're going to bring in insights and understanding from working with dozens of other teams and seeing the same patterns and, and knowing what to look for and knowing where to dig deeper. So I think the mapping every 10 years is insane. I want to see teams mapping every three to six months, which means it has to be an internal capability because no one wants to bring me in every three to six months. Um, but I think that it, there has to be a mix, right? I would, I, I would advise bringing someone in periodically, but then having this regular internal capability of taking that, you know, we've mapped once, our next iteration is going to be less dramatic, uh, perhaps, but because we have the capability and we're building off of a known state, um, we're able to carry that on and repeat that process. Uh, on a more continuous basis. Hey, um, quick follow up. How, so when you do come in and help a team and kind of, or a group or, or, you know, number of teams, you know, one of the things that I see is that there is, uh, and it might just be a defense mechanism. You know, I'm also external a lot of the time. Uh, but what I see is that there is this large amount of confidence portrayed about the knowledge of the existing system. And then when you actually get into mapping, like, so you, so let's say you come in and run a facilitated session, get them to help you map. Whatever map you end up coming out of that facilitated session with, if you then spend, let's say two months observing, right? Those two maps like have almost nothing in common. <laughs> and like, they're, like what was perceived to be the system versus what is the system are like two different things. And it's always my thought, and I haven't spent a lot of time going deeper on this, but like that that's actually usually the biggest defense mechanism that I see like probably driving all, or the, the biggest reason for the defense mechanisms being thrown up is because people really don't know their system, right? And, and their theoretical idea of what it is, is extremely inaccurate. And, and I was interested to see like, if you see the same thing, like, are you seeing that like, what like the manager or what the leader thinks the system is versus like what it actually is couldn't be farther apart. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm reading the the defense mechanism uh, angle correctly, but but so correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I, you know, I could see and I have seen um, you know leaders really kind of shocked to see how different the system is. Uh, on the ground or, or in terms of real flow versus what they understood of the system, um, which is why it's another reason why external facilitation is really valuable, right? Because like, if I don't have a dog in the fight and I don't have a political connection to the organization, I'm not invested in any specific agenda, right? And there's no real fear that I'm out to make anyone look bad. Uh, and I'm very, very sensitive to that too, because we're asking people to open up and we're asking people to take an honest look at what is really happening, uh, which takes a little bit of vulnerability, right? So I, I think it's really important to emphasize the fact that nothing could have happened in a different way, right? There's no way that we could have had a different outcome. The system is always going to just operate as well as it can. And that's not due to any individual, right? This is just based on the system as it's evolving and we can nudge it in specific directions, right? And what matters is not the map. What matters isn't 
the outcome of the session. It's what really kind of evolves out of it, right? Evolves out of our improved understanding of what's going on. And so the fact that our understanding doesn't map up with everybody else's or it doesn't match the map or the map ceases to be useful in a week is irrelevant, right? What really matters is this continuous improvement and a better understanding of what we're working with, which is a complex adaptive system, right? So we want to move people towards that, this comfort with a level of uncertainty, because we know that even though we're uncertain and this is maybe a little bit less comfortable than we were, we're in a better state because we understand how to understand things more and we're operating under fewer assumptions, um, which should provide comfort to people after this internal or this initial like discomfort with like nothing that I thought was real is real, right? <laughs> Once you get past that, and that's why having a facilitator kind of hold your hand through it and say, this is all fine. This is part of it. This is all like part of the process. Um, you get to this point where you're like, okay, we don't need to know everything. We need to know where to focus next and a good enough, uh, view of the system that we can make those decisions with confidence and then experiment, like going back to the experimenting, we're all just experimenting all the time and we're not holding to our assumptions for any extended period. Yeah, I, th I think of it as uh, value stream mapping is the practice. The behavior that's happening is systems thinking, like your systems thinking as a group. And that's the doing that with a group of people that are all going to work together to deliver value to somebody unlocks this like double loop learning of continuous improvement like you were talking about where we're not just focusing on what makes me, Jeff, more uh, effective we're focusing on now what makes the whole entire system more effective? What What's going to help us deliver value faster, better? And what assumptions do I have that maybe aren't true? Or what can I learn about the way other people are, you know, are working inside of the system? And I think that's where the real value comes. So I like where you're going with that. But I, I think we're, I think a lot of the stuff we've been saying is like saying it, we're saying a lot of the same stuff. Um, it's just a different way of thinking about it. What I fear though is anytime we start talking about practices with different leaders, they think, oh, the magic pill is going to be value stream mapping. It's so much better than Scrum. We should just do value stream mapping. We'll get rid of Scrum. Like that's going to that's gonna save us. And it's like, no, no, Like let's not just do this one thing. It's not about one thing. It's not DevOps. It's not Scrum. It's not value stream mapping. It's not whatever. It's this some thinking and thinking about how you improve the whole holistic system and doing that together in groups of people, problem solving teams, you know, focus together to learn as quickly as you possibly can um, is what's really valuable. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Like that progression? Does that, does that jive with oh, the way you talk about it? A hundred percent, you know, like flow engineering for me and the way that I've kind of tried to communicate this is that it's a collection of practices that I found work really well um, and complement each other. And they sort of progress through this flow of starting with outcomes and then looking at the stream and then looking outside and inside the stream kind of naturally progresses through like high uncertainty to high certainty about what to do next. But inside of that, there's, you can interchange any of the individual practices. Like you could swap outcome mapping for impact mapping. If that's something that you you're already comfortable with in your organization and you're probably going to get all the same benefits from, um, you could use just mind mapping if you're really good at that anything that you really want to do to kind of like step away and then think about outcomes that that's going to work well for you. Right. You could even start from something like OKRs or V2 mom. It really doesn't matter. Right. The, what matters is the outcome of that activity. And then similarly in value stream mapping, you could use event storming if you wanted, or you could use, um, information and process flow mapping. You could use swim lanes if you wanted to, whatever you're going to get the desired outcome from. And there's a million different ways to do dependency mapping. There's a million different ways of looking at capabilities. Like nobody has to take my word for uh, how these things should be done or could be done. What matters is that we do them. And flow engineering is really uh, a minimal approach because I find I just want people to do something. So what I'm presenting with flow engineering is like, what I've find as a lazy person, this is the simplest way to do these things. And if you're not doing these things, like 
you know, is it like, could it be helping you with the challenges that you have right now? And could it be worth exploring something like this with a few hours of time, right? I mean, it's not a big investment to do this stuff. And you don't have to go through the entire process, right? Even just taking some time to map outcomes with your team, it just starts really great conversations. And the idea that uh, sharing with your team, we don't know anything, I don't know anything for, sh for certain, and I'm open to learning things, that's a very powerful message to send. And uh, sharing with your team that I'm invested in co-creating a future with you and I want your feedback, your perspective to do that. I'm not going to send anything down to be executed. Um, we're going to create this together and we're going to create a, uh, an increased understanding of the current state and where we want to go. That's very powerful. However you do that is really up to you. And I'm just trying with flow engineering to give people like, this is what I think is the, the least uh, you know, the, the least time and the least effort way of doing that. But I think it, there's no question that it needs to be done. And I think that um, because I haven't seen alternatives, right? I haven't seen teams that say, oh, yeah, we know everything about our desired outcomes and our entire team is on the same page. And if you ask anyone, uh, they're all going to give you the same answer. Like I would with very high confidence say that that's true of almost no organizations. So um, or it might be true once a year when they do a quarterly off or a, a, like an annual offsite or a quarterly offsite. And then for the rest of the time, it's not true. And so how can we build that understanding and then keep it um, relevant to people, keep it close to people so that they can come back to it and continuously refine that understanding? So let's say you got a value stream map. You understand your system. You've built this together with uh, your team, the teams that that are part of your value stream, and you have this shared understanding. What's the signal that you look for the most often to say, "Hey, how do we engineer more flow out of our system?" Like, we we just want we want lower cycle times. We want to get a little bit more throughput, but really we just want to be more responsive. Like, how can we get more flow through? Uh, what do you look for? Like, what's that signal that you're like, we should look at this, and if we can affect this, it will, you know, it'll help us to get that flow. Yeah, well, I, that, that's what I think is really critical about starting from outcomes, right? Because it really, uh, I would say, it's it's never a good idea to just focus on going faster for the sake of going faster. Because it, what you could be really missing is quality. Or you could be building the wrong thing extremely quickly and effectively, right? So depending on what your outcome is, if it's customer satisfaction, if it's employee satisfaction, if it's, uh, you know, we're heading towards an IPO or we just acquired a company and we need to onboard them and decide who has the better practices and how we're going to sell our way of working to them. There's a million different ways that these outcomes can surface and they really dictate everything about what you should do, right? And it, they dictate, um, first of all, what your obstacles are, because you, your obstacles, depending on your outcome, your obstacles, like if, if you're looking to the right and you see a bunch of obstacles, but you should be looking to the left, those obstacles don't matter at all to you, right? So your outcome is everything. And then what happens is you decide on your measurements, right? So what are the metrics that are going to move you towards your outcome? And then you decide on your methods, right? So what you're actually going to do to make progress on the metrics that are going to tell you that you're heading towards your outcome and avoiding your obstacles. And that's the, that's what really goes into outcome mapping the way that I've laid it out is, mm -hmm. is all those things flowing together. And that to me is everything like it without that clarity on the outcome you're really operating under like a ton of assumptions and uh, you could be performing I extremely well and just running in the wrong direction. Hmm. So what I see when I do something similar is that uh, the work time on uh, solving a problem for a customer um, goes through multiple different teams and the, t and the work time is much lower than the actual um, time it sits in some queue waiting to be done. 
And so if you want to get more flow, if you want to run more experiments, we don't know if it's a right or wrong experiment. We, I don't know. But I want to run more so we have the opportunity to learn more. Then I should get rid of delay. And so I should get rid of the delay in the system. It usually means that I also need to remove the number of things that I'm working on. And then I'll get more flow out of the system. Do you see something similar? Oh, absolutely. And th this is something that we've been talking about a lot recently in the Flow Collective is this idea about value versus flow and which one you should focus on first. Um, because you could either say that until we figure out this, is, is this a running topic? It's a running, it's a running topic and I, <laughs> awesome. we have different opinions and I think I've won Jeff over recently. So, Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Well, <laughs> I, I hope to either add to the controversy or, or reinforce somebody's position, <laughs> but maybe it'd be fun to even just, you know, reopen the patient and, uh, and go back at this. But so my argument with this, and this differs inside of the flow collective, we have different opinions and we're working through it which is part of what I love about this community is from my perspective, and this shifted recently, very recently, uh, I shifted from value first to flow first, because I think that until you really have things figured out, you need to run as many experiments as possible, right? And value is what comes out of those experiments, right? So your ability to quickly execute on even, you know, from random guesses all the way to random guesses based on a rough hypothesis to like laser focused, okay, we need to make a decision between A and B. That is what you need to optimize on before you, you discover value. And then once you've discovered value, you're sort of like through this explore, and then you can shift into exploit, or you can start to leverage that exploit pattern and focus on um, the flow of uh, maximizing that value, right? And, and iterating on that value to, to get the, the highest margin. Yeah. So, okay, cool. I'm going to jump in here because this is, this has been a fun topic that keeps coming up. So um, I, I'm going to plus one, everything that you just said and the, the light bulb moment for me. Uh, so generally like product ownership has been the, the role that I've spent the majority of my time in. And even when I'm, coaching or training or talking about value is I try to be super explicit. Value is assumed until it's in the hands of your customer, right? And if you just start with that assumption right there, like it should make sense to you to say, well, first we actually have to get something into the hands of our customer. Like we need to get good at that before we can get good at learning what is truly valuable or what's not really valuable. So starting with an outcome is fantastic but even the outcome is assumed valuable right like regardless of what the feature is what your demographic is that you're going after whatever that happens to break down it is all assumed valuable until you can actually get something out there so make sure you can get something out there then start to optimize the other pieces that are inside of there so i, I think i just repeated everything you said but like that's that's the way i i try to articulate it to really resonate with me what do, what do you think of boobles you're grinning no over i was just I, we i mean this has been going on we kind of keep, keep coming back to this conversation it's like is it customer value or is it frequent delivery which one's more value yes they're it's yes right you want both mm -hmm. but then it's like yes, both. <laughs> yes uh but if you could only pick one which one do you want and it's like well if you get to frequent delivery you'll get to the customer value and you'll figure out what the 10x 100x thing of value is but you're never going to have you don't have a shot of ever figuring that out unless you can have a frequent delivery so um and that comes right. down to flow so like get there first and then we'll figure out the rest like that's and that's a hard thing because i i think you know i don't know I'm not sure where it's taught or if it's you know MBAs well, or it's other places where they're like, nope, you plan this, you do a schedule and you get this thing, you know, and and that's not what works in the product in the product realm or complex realm where there's more unknowns and knowns. We're talking about business, IT, and people. There's lots of unknowns there, and you gotta have frequent feedback loops. And if you don't have that, good luck, you know. I, I think this is recent too. I think this is flipped like in the past couple of decades, right? Which is where the challenge comes from because a lot of these MBA programs and a lot of our traditional understanding of this is basically like you define value, you do some focus groups, you figure out what value is, then you can basically market everybody towards like, you could just force people to value the things that you value 
And that will make up the difference, right? And your barrier to entry is going to be so high and you're going to have a moat around your product that's so deep that that'll be fine. And you can like ship Heinz ketchup for the rest of eternity, right? In the mm-hmm. software world where the barrier to entry is so low and there's competition coming from everywhere and you can be revolutionized out of your business in a heartbeat, that equation is completely flipped, right? There's no longer can you assume that you understand value at all because something's going to come up that just captures people's attention and you'll have a TikTok out of nowhere that just makes Instagram like... Instagram is yesterday's news, right? Yeah. And Instagram is like this super young, innovative company, right? <laughs> We're going to see these yeah. examples all all across every ecosystem. And it's going to hit, you know, physical goods probably last because of, there's still barrier to entry there. But I think the paradigm has shift, shifted, but I think it's so recent. And I think it we really haven't had broad discussions about this and it hasn't been accepted as uh, an official thing yet. So uh, it's it's understandable that it's still confusing to people. And, uh, you know, I say it as a strong opinion loosely held because I'm happy to be, mm-hmm. you know, I've shifted my understanding of this. I was going to call my book that I'm writing right now, Clarity Value Flow, in that order, right? Like, establish clarity, define value, and then get to flow, right? It's flipped now. In the past two weeks, it's completely flipped. <laughs> and so that that's how quickly these things, and I think about this all day, every day, right? That's mm-hmm. my job is to think about this. So if I'm flipping that dramatically, I understand why there's tons of confusion everywhere. Yeah. Um, we had um, Steve Denning on the podcast a while back. And he's got this thing in his book where he talks about how um, a lot of organizations used to think of uh, the organization was kind of in the center like the sun. And then um, customers would rotate around them. And then they would kind of like locate, you know, like they had this force and they would have to have gravity to rotate around them. What the reality of the situation is, is really the customers are in the middle and a bunch of organizations are rotating around them. And so you got to figure a way to put the customer at center and figure out how to satisfy their needs and their wants that they don't even know they have at this point. And I think when you have that world deal switch in your head that you're like, yep, customers are in the middle and we're just one organization that satisfies their needs and they have lots of choices, it changes your outlook on how you work. And um, more, you just determine the only way to do it is get really good at flow and learning really fast because their minds are going to change, you know, as things around them change, technology changes, the world's change, right? Like there's just so much change happening. Even uh, earlier in that example you were using, Steve, uh, you know, we, we did the focus group, we got the research and we're, we're going to slam dunk this. Like, I've, I've heard that and I feel like that's one of the biggest lines of bullshit that we've been fed because it's like, OK, when I hear that, I'm like, OK, so in other words, you've never had the experience of making something exactly what the customer asked for and then them deciding not to buy it from you. Like, you've never had that experience. <laughs> and of course, you've had that experience. Right. Mm-hmm. So like. And I'm not saying like you shouldn't do any of those things. Absolutely. Like building should be the last thing you decide to do uh, as you're, you know, uh, what what is it? Validating your truth curve, right? Like making sure that you're on the right path, eliminating your risks, validating your building, the right thing, et cetera. But building should be the last step inside of there. Um, But I just feel like it's it's such a load of BS where... uh, we feel like all we have to do is build it and they will come. And that's kind of going back to Jeff, what you were saying, that customer centricity that uh, Ahmed was talking about not too mm-hmm. long ago, like all, all those those same concepts and ideas is just super value focused from the perspective of your customer and how quickly can we realize how wrong we really are to Jeff, what you were saying earlier. So where does DevOps come into all this shit? Like we've been talking for like 45 <laughs> minutes now and we haven't even said anything about DevOps. So Steve, like where, where does that fit into the overall equation? Well, these days I don't talk about DevOps very often because it's this slice of the value stream, right? And, and it's kind of a solved problem. It's also suffers from uh, like this confusion, right? Around, around the term, people think it's different things, which means to me, like, it no longer holds a lot of value as a term. If if I say a word to someone and it means dramatically different things to two different people, 
I want to use a different word, right? Because otherwise we're not talking about the same thing. And what is, you know, what is language for at the end of the mm -hmm. day? So I've been frustrated with DevOps for quite a while, even though, you know, I run a meetup, I run a conference, I'm huge in the DevOps community. Um, not as a huge fan. I won't say that I'm a huge influencer in the DevOps community, but um, I think that everything changed when I zoomed out to the value stream and saw DevOps as a useful pattern to represent collaboration and the handoffs between independent groups in an organization or even independent roles. Also uh, understanding the fact that two different groups or individuals can have separate incentives that work against each other, right? So the importance of focusing on outcomes that are more shared values and incentives and zooming out from my specific individual concern to what's best for the customer, what's best for the organization, what's best for the team. Those are the things that I carry from DevOps um, that I think we've learned in the technical community. And the next stage is really looking at value streams. Like there's, I don't think there's any future where DevOps survives as a long-term focus, even agile as a long-term focus. Value streams are just a more useful model. And, and even beyond value streams, because value streams are very simplistic, right? We're talking about a linear flow that doesn't represent reality very well, right? It's a model that's useful, but it's not uh, correct. And so we will eventually, once we can hold these things in our heads and we have tools to facilitate a better understanding of systems, we will move to things like value stream networks and flow networks. Um, because th that is a better model for thinking about how we work and how we deliver value across organizations. We're just not there yet, right? And so DevOps was necessary, but not sufficient. And that's something that I've been saying for a very long time. Um, just like, you know, Agile got us out of a bind. It got us out of project focus and moved us away from some bad practices. Um, but everything is moving us towards flow and continuous delivery and value and outcomes, right? And so whatever is going to facilitate that, whether, you know, we borrow things from DevOps, we borrow things from Agile. Um, I think what really matters here and the message that I would like to, to, to send people is like, don't stick with a model uh, that isn't serving you, right? And as long as something is serving you, it's great but constantly be looking at what is the bigger picture? How does all this fit together? And, and what outcome is this serving? And so for me, DevOps, like it, it got me thinking broader beyond development. It got me thinking beyond operations. And now the value stream has broadened that even further. And probably before it's useful, I'm going to start thinking in terms of value stream networks and value chain networks and how mm -hmm. streams and chains are connecting together to deliver customer value and organizational value and, and individual contributor value and how all these things fit together, uh, which can't fit in, like, can't fit in my head. Honestly, uh, it, it, it's really complex stuff. But, um, you know, hopefully we develop models, we develop deeper understanding and some tools that can help us do this more effectively because, you know, we're so far from understanding all the things, all the butterfly effects that are like really happening in the world. Um, so like to get us there, it's, it's going to take a lot of evolution and thinking, a lot of models that haven't really been well established. But I'm, that's kind of my life mission is to understand these things much more effectively and then be able to translate these ideas into like, here's what this means for you so that you can make a better decision tomorrow and, and consistently make better decisions. So uh, a lot to unpack there, but I'm kind of curious if Bradley, you're still there. Uh, any, any thoughts or feedback on any of that that you heard? Uh, it's still here. Uh, yeah, I guess... You know, it's, it has been kind of always the challenge with DevOps, right? That there's like 3 billion definitions of it. Um, and a lot of people will articulate it a lot of different ways. You know, I think ultimately what really just matters is that, and I think at the core of what you were saying, Steve, is that our current systems suck. <laughs> They're really bad at 
doing what, what we're talking about. And like, we need to reimagine it all, but we need to do it in a systematic way. And, you know, I, DevOps is part of that. Value stream mapping is part of that. Agile is part of that. You know, it's, it's, you know, looking at each one of these elements of how things are delivered, right. Or, or operated, et cetera. And saying like, okay, you know, this, this is not built for what we need it to anymore and reimagining it. I, I think that, you know, ultimately, um, that, you know, if, if people have that perspective, I, you know, I think it's, you, you'll eventually come to the right conclusion and look for the right tools and ways to approach that and practices, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to die in any hill and say that the specific term DevOps and all its permutations have done any good job at, at, uh, at simplifying things. But I think if you just take it back to, hey, this thing's broken and we need ways to fix it, right? And then evolve it. So that's what I would say. Mm-hmm. There's there's one other piece that I think is is important uh, that was missing from DevOps and and got me in trouble and and I think gets a lot of people in trouble is when you frame things in terms of a value stream you get two things out of that first you get like value is a first class citizen right so this idea that there is a customer there's always a customer and everything should be in service of that customer. That's number one that's kind of missing from DevOps, right? DevOps, you can very well be like automate everything, um, just do everything as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, and just forget about the fact that you're doing the wrong thing that doesn't, like your customers don't care about. And that's a very easy trap to fall into, right? Because there's nothing in there that says like, first of all, you need to understand your customers, which is not really, uh, you know, an engineer's problem to solve. It's more of a product thing. But there's, you know, telling product people they need to understand DevOps and vice versa is challenging, right? There's not really shared language there. The other piece about uh, value streams that I think is important is the stream aspect is emphasizing flow, right? It's emphasizing the fact that we need to keep things moving. We need to make sure that we're constantly learning and adapting. And so I think that the terminology is really valuable. And, you know, it's not perfect. Of course, it has this like legacy attachment to like old school manufacturing that a lot of people trip over. And if you look up value stream mapping, Wikipedia is going to make you like hate it uh, because it's pretty messy the way that most people do it Um, or uh, the way people have traditionally done it. I'll say that. Um, And it is challenging to take the understanding from a manufacturing context and apply it to software. That's another hurdle for people, which is why I now talk more about flow engineering than I talk about value stream mapping specifically, because I think these things that people trip over are really problematic. The other um, valuable thing about thinking in terms of value streams is that uh, it matters to the business. The business speaks that language. They understand value. They understand value stream. Like if you say value stream to a CEO, they're like, oh yeah, like I, I know what that is. Like they, they might not know what their value streams are, but once you kind of spend two seconds on the explanation. They're like, yeah, okay. I, I know where all the value streams are and I know how all that fits together, which is super powerful because if you talk about DevOps to a CEO, they're like, what is this? And why are you bothering me with this new term that I don't care about? Like, what does it have to do with me and my customer Mm -hmm. and what I'm trying to do? How does it help me achieve my goals? And then you're going to have to argue for, you know, even if you get the chance, you've got an uphill battle. Yeah, I like that the, the, using the term value stream mapping. I mean, uh, I've we've used like um, causal loop diagrams to kind of do that network uh, approach. You know, it's the same type of idea, right? You're trying to visualize a flow and the impact of one variable on another variable or another part of the system on another part of the system, and what actually happens here. And the systems are getting more and more complex as the days go on. So uh, the the need for something like that to have some common language, even if it's not right, but be able to say, this is what we think it is today. So what we can see is, you know, here is where the biggest impact would be made. If we want to get this outcome, we think we have to do this. Let's run an experiment here. You know, um, I think getting to that point is, or getting to that shared understanding so you can make those adjustments is a, is a really valuable thing. Another piece, if I can just, I know we're trying to wrap up, but one last thing to interject here is I think that not only are our systems getting more complex, but 
our understanding of existing complex systems is becoming more apparent. Like it's, we're now starting to understand things like intersectionality, right? It, like in common dialogue outside of technology, people are starting to see systems in the real world, right? They're starting to see how, yeah. how does a global economy affect me? How does government affect me? Yes. How does like, yeah. what does policing mean? Like all these things, the, these are all connecting, right? All of these concepts, if you understand systems thinking, you can understand a lot about the world. And if you understand how individual contributions and effects contribute to uh, outcomes and results, then all of a sudden the world just makes a lot more sense to you. And you can start to think about, okay, well, nothing's as simple as I thought it was, but I'm actually okay with that level of complexity, right? I'd rather see the real world. And, and I don't know if everyone would rather see like how complex things really are, but to me, I'd rather be thinking about how things are um, because that is the first step from my perspective to being empowered to kind of improve things and address things and move in the right direction. So the first part about it to me is about having useful models that um, represent reality more um, correctly or, or usefully, I'll say. And, you know, I, I will say that like investing and in understanding this has, has helped me have better conversations about everything, like just across the board. Right. And it's not that I, of course, everyone likes to hit everything with the same hammer, but with something like systems thinking, you you uh, you could do way worse than than using that model to try and understand any kind of complex adaptive system. Yeah, we should be teaching this in elementary schools, and people should have more of the systems thinking. There you go. Exactly. Um, just build that skill set up. Which one right? is that that you just held up? These. Yep. <laughs> These two books. Well, that one I'm gold. With, yeah. I was yep. The Fifth Discipline and, and Thinking in Systems. Thinking yep. in two systems, great yeah. systems thinking books. Two great books. I think I literally just finished Thinking in Systems a few weeks ago. Yep. Donella Meadows. Yeah. yeah. Somebody had recommended that one. And it's funny you bring that up because uh, I, I, I don't know if I attribute it to him or I, I know I heard it in his class, but Larman was saying, and you almost hit, hit the nail on the head with the quote where it was, all systems models uh, diagrams are wrong and some are useful. Like all models, uh, all models are wrong, and some are useful. Yeah, there, there we go. That's exactly what was running through my head as you were as you were talking almost this entire show. Where it was more about the conversation and what are we trying to get out of this versus how accurate is it to is it to reality. Uh, the last thing I want to add on real quick is because we were just talking with another great PST in the community. Scott will have an episode here. Well, it'll be released before this one, but that's where that whole diversity comes from, right? Like getting somebody else's input on this is only going to help enhance the conversation around what the system really is. So bringing those people in, like you were talking about being an outsider, coming in, having a fresh set of eyes, but really, you know, making sure that not just the people that we're bringing to the conversation are diverse, but also that they're included in the conversation that feel free to speak up in the conversation is just going to give you a better understanding of the system as a whole and why you're coming out, achieving the outputs of the outcomes that you actually are through your system. Yeah. And, it, you know, as a, as a team, as an organization, if you want to put your money where your mouth is, you know, you should be having workshops like this. You should be bringing people in and saying like, what is, what does this look like to you? What's your experience with this? Where do you see things breaking down? What's your understanding about our biggest constraint or challenge? Uh, what would you like to see? You know, like, what is your vision for this system? And so having these like models that, pull those insights and ideas and feedback out of this diverse representation across the value stream is a way of saying that, you know, we really are committed to this and we see value in it. We're not just talking about it. This is something that is improving our organization directly. And so we don't just have to talk about these things and feel like we should do them. Um, it's actually driving positive improvement. Um, and I think that's really powerful because beyond that, um, there, there's not a lot of things that people are using to put that into practice, right. To make it real. That's great. So as we're kind of wrapping up here, Steve, um, is there anything you want to plug or promote to our listeners? Um, 
Oh, I, I'm I'm allergic to plugs, but there's a free. So <laughs> if anything is, if anything is uh, interesting about this, and people are are looking for more detail or kind of how to put this into practice, uh, if they go to flow.visible.is, that's a landing page for an ebook that covers all of this from start to finish with the with examples of like how this works in the real world. Um, in, in a way that they could do it themselves. They could read the book and they could do it themselves and they can get started. Um, so that's, a, that's something I love to share. Uh, I'm also working on a seven day email course. So you could sign up for a mailing list and you're going to get like step by step every day. It's going to go through outcome mapping, value stream mapping, and these various mapping techniques and then how to, how to use them. Um, and that's coming up very soon. So if you download the book, you'll get added to the list and you'll get the course when it's released. And I'm going to commit to getting that out next week because I've been procrastinating too much. So if I put it out into the world, I will have no excuse and I'll, and I'll get that done. Thank you for listening to The Agile Wire. We are consistently inspecting and adapting ourselves. We would appreciate feedback at feedback at theagilewire.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play Store. See you next time.